Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Tumblr, Guilt Group, Kickstarter, LinkShare, Tech Sector, Silicon Alley, Big Data, New Tech City. Something's happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear, at least to me. To help clarify what it's all about is Heidi Messer, the founder with her brother and husband of Collective Eye, a cloud-based business intelligent platform that allows business leaders to answer their toughest questions through big data analysis, so they say. An entrepreneur and investor in the digital economy, Ms. Mesta also found LinkShare, whose sale in 2005 for $425 million in cash was, quote, a shock felt around the world, close quote. Welcome, Heidi. Thank you. Thank this you stuff me. is absolutely fascinating. My, sort of my first question is, you get a half hour with Mayor de Blasio, Mayor-elect de Blasio. What do you tell him? But before you tell him anything, just tell us, What's the tech sector? So the tech sector is a group of companies that um, do a couple of things. Some of them innovate and actually create technology. Um, some of these companies apply technology. And then I would say sort of on the periphery are the companies that really use the technology that's created. So it becomes an ecosystem around what is a new age, a new digital age. Ooh, OK. You're in with de Blasio. Mm -hmm. What do you want from him? What do you tell him? What's the first thing you tell him? Well, the first thing I would do is I would congratulate him on an incredible campaign because it really was the first campaign that actually used technology to an advantage. Um, really, really stellar. It was textbook. You know, have a clear message and then syndicate it across multiple platforms. Um, but I think, you know, speaking now on behalf of the technology industry, say it's one thing to win an election. Now everybody wants to know what's the plan. Right. What happens next? Right. So, there's a lot of talk about raising taxes, um, a lot of talk about the inequities in the city, and I think they're really profound. But the question is, what's the long-term solution? What's, what do you have in mind besides just taxing the rich and, um, and kind of continuing on a policy of equalization that goes through taxes? Does that make sense? Yes, of course. So, um, yeah, but I, beyond that, I have so much stuff that I would say to him. I mean, you know, if you look at the technology industry, um, New York is sort of in this very, very interesting place, and de Blasio has a huge opportunity to create a legacy, um, or also to create some not so great. So you tests. talked about a tale of two futures. Go ahead. Yes. What are these two futures? So um, one of the things that I thought was really, really um, powerful about his message in his campaign was he talked about a tale of two cities, um, and it is true. You know, poverty is up to I think 20 percent in New York City since you know Bloomberg took office, which is um, very, very high relative to the rest of the nation. Um, but there's, there's a couple of ways to get at that problem. And one of them is, you know, to kind of go with the old school way of doing things. Um, and that's where I say the tale of two futures. Um, you have a future where you have a group of people who are now equipped to compete in the digital economy, or you invest in what I would call sort of legacy industries, legacy structures. Like what? So I think the finance industry, for example, is, you know, has sort of flatlined. And if you look at that and say, you know, you have to, you know, fly that plane until it lands and it's going to land and we can see the landing strip on it. Um, you have to think about, you know, what are the industries that are innovating that are actually creating jobs? Um, you know, education is a good example. Uh, you know, you think about what it would be like um, when the automobile was first starting if you created a whole bunch of schools to teach horse and buggy repair. You know, that, you know, ha just investing in education and saying that's your policy, what kind of education? I think less than a third of uh, the graduates of high school, public high schools today, are equipped either for jobs or for college. Yep. Yep. Um, that number is astounding. And you have, you know, in, in my industry, the idea that of unemployment is unthinkable. At any given time, we have hundreds of jobs out there that are posted that we just can't find the talent to fill. What kind of talent would fill it? What is your greatest talent need or the, in, or, or the sector's greatest talent need? Well, certainly, I think STEM, um, people with STEM backgrounds, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, right now, New York, I believe, graduates 11% of its graduates with those degrees, and that's pretty much 80% of what the technology needs, technology sector needs. Um, so that is a huge, huge hole that we, we don't see getting filled. 
Um, you've heard me talk before, immigration policy, yep. I think, is, Go ahead. Um, I call it the greatest threat to our national security, is not passing the immigration bill. Um, if we can't have the talent that's ready now, before we lose this industry, we need to import it. And that's not because we don't have the homegrown talent, which you just home, described. We don't have it. So we have to grow the homegrown talent, and we'll t talk a little bit more how to do that. But we've got to import the talent, and, and we can't do it. We can't do it because right now the immigration policies are so strict. I mean, part of it is it's done on a lottery, which to me is insane right. because we have certain specific needs. Um, the other part of it is it's you know mired in bureaucracy, and the other part of it is it's greatly limiting in terms of who you can actually bring into the country. So, I would say as a business, our one of our greatest expenses are the legal fees associated with bringing wow. immigrants in and getting wow. visas. Wow. Now, what are the skills that these folks bring that we're not generating internally or not generating enough internally? Well, I think, for example, you know, science and math are obviously um, greatly in demand. Um, we don't teach coding in most schools, which I think is also an incredible thing. And when you think about the skills that you would need, um, you know, it's funny when I was when I was preparing for this, I thought a lot about you know the tech industry, and it, and it has sort of a naturally progressive agenda. So in many ways, it should be very tightly aligned with the Blasi. Mm -hmm. We believe very much in education, very much in you know lower cost housing, so we mm -hmm. can import labor sure. and have it work here. Um, but you know where we sort of differ is, you know, the poster children for um, for our industry, you know, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Steve Jobs, the Bill Gates, a lot of them dropped out of school. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they were, you know, they were dumb or they were kicked out. It was, you know, school just didn't have the challenges for them that they saw the opportunities going towards. And I think, you know, they were fortunate in that they found another path. But if we could somewhat somehow look at our educational system and think, okay, what are the skills? that people are actually going to need and how do we prepare them for it instead of sticking to a legacy system that's turning out ill-prepared. What about a cooperative adventure of, among the people in the tech sector to create your own educational system that might mentor or actually grant courses, et cetera, for these kind of folks? Oh, I think we're already doing it. Oh, I, mean, okay. I think, you know, um, and, and we're not doing it in a formal way that you're suggesting. We're doing it in... Um, you know, the other biggest cost in, in my businesses has always been training. So, you know, you recruit people and you say, okay, if they have 80% of the skills that I need, I'll train them on the other 20%. Mm -hmm. And so what ends up happening is the private sector sort of says, okay, here are the skills that are lacking from the graduates sure. that we're getting, and we'll invest in courses and we'll, we'll make it happen. So getting back to, you know, talking to Blasio, if I was sitting in front Go ahead. Of him, I would say, you know, it, it's... It's one thing to, to win an election um, with the message of change. I mean, we saw that movie before with President Obama. Yep, and, yep. And very similar. Very similar. And I think, you know, what's ironic about it is that it's, it's very uniting when you're, when you're winning an election because change means a lot of things sure. to a lot of different people. It's a people. Rorschach test. Exactly. And I hope, would hope for him that he would come up with a very coherent vision and then work very hard to get people on the bus and build a community around that what's vision. What's the vision? From the tech perspective? Yeah. And so I think the vision from the tech perspective is to recognize that um, you have a tax base in New York that's, that's relatively small, that's contributing a lot of sure. the income. So we were talking backstage about how you know, roughly 35,000 people contribute 43% of New York's taxes. So if the strategy is, okay, we're going to tax those people more and then put it into education, mm -hmm. I think the tech vision would be to say, okay, now what kind of education are we right. investing in? Right. How are we going to convert some people who don't have the skills today into the skills that they need tomorrow? So STEM is incredibly important yep. for us. Um, affordable housing, you know, so that if I recruit people here, they have a place to live. I would think that ultimately the lack of affordable housing could really provide a break on this whole process. Yeah, it, I think that's absolutely correct. I mean, if I recruit engineers and they're getting in, you know, six figures and they can't find a place to live in New York and can't raise their families, um, and, you know, most of them are very, very committed to educating their families in the same way they were educated, if they can't find those opportunities here, I can't get them to come here. Um, so, you know, certainly having some sort of a plan for that. Um, I think supporting centers of innovation so, you know, in all the boroughs, having some sort of a high-tech either university or initiative, um, whether it's, you know, having a, a place where people can start businesses and they have lower-cost mm -hmm. rents to do that. Does the city provide these things now? I mean, Bloomberg's got the reputation of being a tech guy, but, you know, what's the report card? What, what do we keep and what do we add? 
So I, I think, you know, from the tech sector, people were pretty pretty pleased with Bloomberg for the most part. Um, you know, I, I think you, you always wear two hats. One is, you, you know, you're a citizen of New York and you want to see the city thrive. And then the other is you have a specific business. And certainly bringing Technion University to New York was a huge, yep. you know, tremendous coup. And, um, and he's got a lot of fans in the tech sector for that. Um, what's interesting is that he, he did a great job in fostering this sector. I think in 06 it was, you know, sort of a blip. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing this for a while. I've been doing it since the mid-90s. I, I can know. tell you, when, when I started, there were very few venture capitalists. There were very few startups. And, and you started Linkshare with your own funds. We did. We did because we couldn't find venture wow. capitalists here. I mean, you know, Silicon Valley, you fall off, you know, down the stairs and you get funded for something. <laughs> nice. nice. <Yeah. laughs> Ooh, a little, bit of, a little bit of something there. Well, you know, I think um, it's, it's definitely a, a, a big competitor to New York, and I think... Um, you know, Mayor de Blasio needs to be very conscious of the fact that this is an IP industry. Um, it's not manufacturing where you have, you know, plants and, right. you know, sort of fixed, right. um, fixed structures. Um, it's an industry where everyone is aware of how global the nature of the industry is. I mean, the minute I put a website up on the Internet, I'm an international business person. Um, that is very revolutionary compared, mm -hmm. to, compared to other industries. And so... Um, it is a mobile industry. It's not an industry that's going to stick around and, you know. And so you have to provide incentives. Now, it, 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 the city itself, though, is a tremendous incentive. The bars, the restaurants. It is. And everything else. But then you've got the housing problem, which you've already mentioned. But what's interesting to me is that all this technology allows you to be on the moon and to be able to communicate. And you have all these high-tech companies gravitating toward New York and other cities. Mm -hmm. Well, it makes sense because New York has a wonderful place in, in, in terms of access to global markets. Um, New York has incredible talent. I mean, I have a lot of reasons why I love to be here. And, and I've had choices to move and, and haven't chose to. Um, I think the talent pool is better. I think it's a more interesting place. Um, I love the fact that I feel dumb every day when I'm here. So <laughs> that, yeah, that's great. That's great. No, I understand. That's absolutely right. I can always right. find someone yep. smarter in in a field that um, that's different than mine, and that's very inspiring. And um, the museums and and just sort of the the livelihood of um, of of the social life that you can have here. And even as a business person, you know, I can do two events in an evening, and the amount of networking I can get done is right. extraordinary. Right. Um, I don't have to twist anyone's arm to come to New York, but. You know, one of the things that, that is sort of, um, I, w I would say this mayor really should keep track of is, you know, the city is the safest it's ever been. And, you know, arguably, uh, you know, I think some of the tactics that were used under the Bloomberg administration are not um, what I would consider long-term tactics or, mm -hmm. or ones that I would, um, I can understand where resentment was built from those. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, it's easy to win an election and say that was a really bad idea. Mm -hmm. Well, now I want to hear, what's your good idea? How do, how do you keep the city safe? Right. It's you an know? imperative. you got to do it's it. It's an imperative because I think, you know, when people feel like they can take the subway at 9 o'clock at night um, and they can go out, you know, you recruit a lot of people who used to be afraid to live in sure. New York. Sure, sure. Um, now, how do you sell New York? Do you have to ever, ever really sell it? But how do you sell it? The hardest part of selling New York, I would say, is the, the cost of living here. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody wants to come live here. I think everyone sort of has a dream, whether it's, you know, two years of their life or or decades, but everyone has this sort of vision of this is a city that they want to live in. Um, but it's very hard to recruit someone here who's living in a place, you know, with a house and a yard and good schools around them yeah. to come to a place sure. where they have to d downsize their life. Um, the schools are questionable. Yep, yep, um, yep. you got to go in many ways you either go private or good public schools, which there are a lot of but not enough of. Not enough of, so. So. Have we been here before? I mean, I, I, I'm looking at the data. Now we're the number two tech sector in, in, in the country place. You know, there's, there's Silicon Valley. There was Route 128. Forget Route 128. Mm -hmm. we're, we're it now. But we, in a sense, we've been here before. I mean, I remember 12 years ago that, you know, you had dot-com boom, dot-com bust. What's what's different now? What what makes this tech boom different than the previous one? So I think um, I think the first was what do they call it when there's a prelude to an earthquake? You know, sort of a, a pre-shock, yeah, sort of an aftershock. Right. And and I think you know when you look at what people thought were crazy valuations in in 2000, um, 
you know, we actually tried to go public during that time, so I'm very aware of <laughs> how the market crashed. Ooh. Um, and, and you sort of see this very interesting parallels between 2001 um, in the internet industry and 2008 in the finance industry. Right. And, you know, for 2001, I think the expectations um, had not caught up to the reality. Uh-huh. And then what you saw in the couple of years after that was the reality actually started to surpass people's mm -hmm. expectations. Mm -hmm. So you start to th see things sure. like Twitter and um, an industry really bounce back, an industry that actually is, is really growing when you look at every indication of it. Um, you know, the finance crash, I think, was sort of the beginning of a slow decline. Yeah. And so um, it's very easy to sort of put those two together. And, and you know, the, the challenge will be since the entire economy in the entire world, in my opinion, is converting from analog to digital. Sure. Um, so, you know, there are the three sectors I mentioned, the people who are innovating and creating technology, the people who are using that technology and applying it to things which New York is particularly good at, and then the people who are consuming that. Um, New York has this great opportunity to be the hub of that. And the, the other side benefit of it for New York is, you know, I truly believe that the technology industry is the last great white hope for a middle class in New York. Go ahead. Um, you know, if you look at the structure of, of how, you know, our industries, um, the salaries break out, I think the average salary in a technology venture is $85,000. Mm -hmm. um, that's the average salary. You know, in the tech world, it's very much sort of the inequalities that de Blasio described. You know, you have the very, very wealthy mm -hmm. people at the top, and then you have a lot of yep. service industries, yep. 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 you yep. know, um, that are created. So when they say they create six jobs, it's not necessarily six high-paying jobs. Mm -hmm. it's, um, six service jobs to keep you know people at the top um, satisfied. In the tech industry, most of the people, it's, it's a much more um, even um, distribution. So because the skills are so high for the people that we, we employ um, on every level, we tend to pay higher salaries. Mm -hmm. And so fostering that industry creates a very different dynamic. Um, I'll give you an example. There's, um, there's a company called Waze in Israel that um, just sold for a billion dollars to Google. Great mapping technology, 100 employees after the sale, 100 millionaires. Done. Um, you know, you think about it. Nice. But, and you think about what that 100 millionaires would mean. You know, I, I mentioned the 35,000 people who pay 43% of the right, taxes. Right, right, right. What that means to a tax base instantly. So, I mean, if this doesn't become one of his, de Blasio's top imperatives, I would be very, very disappointed. So what you've got is, what you're describing is a financial sector in decline, Wall Street in decline, less, fewer bonuses, less tax revenue, not a, not a, not a growth sector. Mm -hmm. And what you seem to be seeing is that you, you've got this tech sector adding 60,000 jobs, 65,000 jobs, more and more and more. The economy becomes a very different economy. It becomes more diversified, less finance dependent. Mm -hmm. But what's the net? What's what's being produced here? I mean, what's you know this biotech and mobile? I mean, talk about what you do. Let's let let's move to a specific. All right. Let's go to Collective Eye. Now you sold LinkShare for four hundred twenty-five million dollars. But the money ain't the juice. What's the juice? What drives this really entrepreneurial, not only New York, but a New York economy, this new, new economy? So, um, so when we started LinkShare, it was really at the, we started in 1996. So wow. it was at the very beginning of, of the digital world kind of coming into its own. I mean, you know, internet connectivity was so slow and um, it's not, it's better, but it still could be better in New York. I won't get started on that. Yep. Um, this is a problem. It is a problem. A big it problem. It is a problem. I mean, with not enough. When Kansas and Texas and, you know, Kansas. has Excuse better me. bandwidth than. I know, blood pressure. I have to take my medicine. <laughs> Go ahead. But, um, and it, 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 you know, we laugh about it, but it actually Oof. is what attracts innovation. Sure. It's sure. the possibility of all the things that you could do if you had that bandwidth. Um, but getting back to Collective Eye, you know, in my opinion, that's sort of, you know, the internet now is in a different stage. And, um, you know, it, everyone talks a lot about big data. I actually hate um, the term big data because it makes you focus on the size of the data rather than the fact that now all of a sudden we have the opportunity to process data in a way that can create huge innovations. Talk, talk a little bit about big data. I mean, I was listening to WFAN on Sunday, listening to the giant game in this EMC corporation that talks about Big data. So some, something big is going on when you're advertising on football games. Absolutely. So, um, 
So, you know, think about the fact that now, um, you know, you have your cell phone that you carry with you all the time. Uh -huh. You have sensors everywhere. I mean, you know, I wear this to track my sleep and how far I walk. And, um, and suddenly, all this human behavior is visible. Right. And, um, and in a sense, you know, visible in a global sense. So now if you have the combination of the human be behavior that's visible, unbelievable processing power that's been developed on the part of computers mm -hmm. and creative minds who are, you know, the one thing that the U.S. has, because we haven't even talked about, you know, the global competition. Yeah, well, I mean, well, we will, and, but go ahead. Um, you know, you have this sort of global um, tool, you know, the Internet that allows for collaboration. Mm -hmm. That is the perfect mix to allow tremendous innovations to happen. So um, you've collected the data. Like, imagine now if you could see directly into the human body everything that was happening. How many diseases could you cure sure. just from having the visibility into it? But now picture that times you know, 50 billion with the processing power that's there combined with human ingenuity. And to me, that was, that's what got me out of bed again to do this the second time. Because believe me, when you know the hours that entrepreneurs work, it has to be a really good reason. But it's, a ju it's the juice. It's the satisfaction of doing it and, and, and you get an adrenaline rush from this stuff constantly. It sounds good. It is fun. It's fun. You know, it's fun because you can see the change happening. Um, you know, we're going from an industrial economy that was based on manufacturing and assembly line thought processes to a digital economy that's focused on data. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that instead of, you know, the old way was you developed a product, you found the cheapest way to produce it, you threw it out there and marketing kind of fixed everything mm -hmm. that was wrong with it. The new way is you take all that data, you analyze it, and you figure out what people want, what the market wants, and then you produce it. And then you create, you know, incredible innovations. And it's things that are, you know, mind-blowing that you would never even, you know, an electric car, right? Think about that, the mm -hmm. hyperloop. I mean, right. I think Elon Musk is incredible. Right. I mean, you know, the fact that you could possibly get from L.A. to San Francisco in an hour by train. I mean, Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. It's unbelievable, right. right? And so, you know, this kind of innovation is, is not going to be new. I think you're going to have a huge renaissance. And, and my hope for New York City is that, that it's the center of it because, you know, it isn't confined to borders anymore. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, for manufacturing, where was the cheapest place you can manufacture? You didn't need terrific talent on right. the assembly right. line. Right, But if we can keep that in New York and you think about, you know, companies like Collective Eye that – that are helping other companies use this data in a way that gives them huge advantages. If we can keep that in New York and keep that in the United States, you have an enormous advantage around the world. Yeah. One of the fascinating things about this big data is that you don't need to be that accurate, that each piece of data is just out there, and but collectively, if you've got 10 billion pieces in your sample, you get these probabilities. So. What does all that mean in terms of what you do for a business? Yeah, well, yes and no about the accuracy piece. Go ahead. I mean, for us, you know, to start with, we don't really care about the size of the data. We're completely question driven. Right. Um, so Collective Eye actually it focuses on four areas: sales, marketing, customer support, and services. Right. And what we help businesses do is help their internal operations in those areas become much more efficient and much more um, take advantage of opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise see that would be blinded to the human eye. Um, very quick example, um, you know, you look at how uh, a salesperson prepares for uh, to call on a client. Go ahead. On average, it takes 45 minutes, um, and they all do the same things. You know, the good salespeople probably take an hour. The less good salespeople take five minutes. Okay. But on average, it takes 45 minutes, and they all do. They all look at LinkedIn. They all look at Google. They all look at look at um, Salesforce.com. And we said, you know, what if we just automated that process and just gave them the things they needed to know in one second? And we gave it to them directly. They didn't have to beg for IT. They didn't have to, you know, do right. it themselves. Um, if you do that, think about, you know, if there's five times a day that you do that, you've just gained, you know, sure. almost five hours worth of productivity. Now, but the data that you use is data that they've generated, data that you've generated, both kinds of data. We use whatever data is needed to answer okay. the question that's available. So we don't just sort of go out into the ether and say, there's so much data out there, let's just dive in. You know, to right. me, that's the equivalent of going into the Library of Congress and saying, discover something. Right, thank you. You can't do that. I've you have been to there. Have, I've um, done that, in <laughs> fact. I'm sorry, but go ahead. You probably could, but for, for most people who are you know, a regular intelligence, you would have to actually have a question-driven approach and right. say, like, right. what is it that I want to find out? Right. Some sort of a scientific method. And the reason that I said that um, analytics, and that's the other word for what we do, analytics and business intelligence. That's what I was going to ask you. I mean, what is analytics? So, um, so an analysis can be something as simple as two plus two is four. Right. right. And so analytics is basically the idea that you 
go to data and you derive conclusions from that data, processing it in some way. Based, based on the answer to specific questions. Well, not you. There are a lot of ways to do oh, it. Oh, okay. You can, you can have predictive analytics. Oh, okay, okay. To predict I get it. And, but you know, the thing about it that is, is LinkShare was a transactional system, Collectivize is an analytical system. And you said about you know you don't have to be exactly accurate. Um, the thing about analytics is you kind of do. You okay. Do pretty accurate. Okay. So like if two plus two equals five. Like you actually can go down some pretty bad paths. This is true. Um, I actually heard a great use of, of what's called big data. Um, there was a study that was done of the prison population, and they found that 80% um, of the prison population in this one particular place was from one zip code. And so what they said was, okay, well, let's invest a million dollars into gentrifying that particular neighborhood, and we can reduce the prison population. Brilliant insight. Um, what if it had been off by one number, the zip code? Million dollars wasted. So that's that's the beauty of it. analytics. Okay. That's the tough part of analytics. Okay. If you're not accurate, you can waste a whole lot of time and money. But if you are, if, and if there, you want to eliminate human error, and that's the big challenge to right. analytics. Right. Right. But if you are accurate, it's tremendously powerful. Okay. We started off with and and continued with sort of advice to the mayor. Mm -hmm. What about advice to startups? What about business advice given? Given the nature of the sector it's it, right now, and given the sort of the regulatory environment, the environment, what what would you recommend? What's your advice? Well, the, the first is I would watch what's happening on a governmental level because um, regulation right now is the mortal enemy of innovation. Um, you know, you have a situation where you have technology, um, digital natives that are living separate from the digital immigrants that okay. are making the regulations. Okay. So, so I think for startups, you do want to look for a business-friendly environment to start your company because that's going to become increasingly okay. important. Um, hire the best talent. Um, go where the talent is. I happen to think it's in New York, but I'm very biased. Sure. I've been here for a while. Well, you're biased. Um, and, um, and I think there's never been, and, and I've been an entrepreneur for a long time, there's never been a better time. And also, one of the things that you do is you dream big and you stay focused and yes. you get into the game over and over and over again. Yeah, I think that's the hardest thing. You know, for entrepreneurs, you're always attracted to what's new and what's innovative. Right. Um, but when you fix on one idea, the, the key thing is to be laser focused and not get distracted. And that is very hard to do in the technology well, space. Well, that would be also advice to the mayor. My thanks to Heidi Messer for bringing us up to date on our future. Join me next week here on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.